our family matriarch, Anne Bryant, my great-great-grandmother, was born into slavery in 1860. Her mother, Lydia, was enslaved and taken from Sierra Leone, West Africa. Lydia and Anne, they took on the name Bryant. And when Anne was a baby, slavery was abolished. And as she grew up, she continued to work for the Bryant family and later became a sharecropper, farmer, and a midwife. Anne Bryant had 11 children. Her children's names were Corny, Roby, John, Ernest, Metty, Wed, Lydia, Gade, Evelyn, Herbert, and Clinton. All of her children accomplished great things during their lifetime. Gade Bryant was born on June 13, 1895 as Anne's eighth child. His father's name was Makija Rosser. We are going to showcase highlights of one of Gade's many accomplishments. First, we will take a look at a brief history of Chatham County to highlight obstacles Gade faced when he moved to the community where he raised his family. His ability to transcend challenges through his strong character of faith and diligent work ethic and perseverance allowed him to create a life and existence that established a legacy for all of us to have as a model. Gade in his adult life moved to Moncure, a small rural unincorporated community near Pittsburgh, the county seat in southeastern Chatham County, North Carolina. It was here that he established his homestead with his wife, Maud Lee, and had 11 children. Pittsboro, North Carolina was founded in 1785 and named after William Pitt, who served as British Prime Minister from 1766 to 1768. William Pitt was known for opposing harsh colonial policies. In 1787, Pittsboro was officially named the county seat. Chatham County is named for William Pitt, first Earl of Chatham, whereas Pittsboro is named for his son, William Pitt the Younger. Chatham County backbone was not large plantations, but the development of small farms where the enslaved were foundational to the owner's productivity and success. By 1860, one-third of the county population were African Americans, chiefly enslaved. Chatham County is the home of James Waydell, commander of the Confederate cruiser Shenandoah, which carried the only Confederate flag that ever went around the world. As the county seat, Pittsboro has been a center of trade and local government, including the courts. Many farmers would come into town on the weekend for trade. In 1881, a new county courthouse and jail were built in Pittsboro. After the Civil War, European-American violence against the recently enslaved increased in a determination to maintain the privileges and status of European-Americans. From the late 1860s, Terrorist groups such as the Ku Klux Klan, Constitutional Union Guard, White Brotherhood, and others consistently pressed to enforce those privileges through fear, intimidation, and death, even though the Civil Rights Act of 1866 had been passed. During the 1870s, Jim Crow laws were enacted locally and statewide. The laws enforced racial segregation and discrimination in public and private activities. And this lasted through the 20th, almost through the mid 20th century. The intent of these laws was to disenfranchise the gains African Americans had realized and remove what they had accomplished during the Reconstruction Act of approximately 1865 through 1877. Unfortunately, Chatham County embraced this period. And this was exemplified in 1885 in Pittsburgh when a notorious incident of lynching took place of four African Americans, including a woman. The woman was the spouse of one of the victims. 
Chatham County was the second highest total or had the second highest total of lynching in the whole state of North Carolina. There are only two other counties that matched Chatham County's total. Jim Crow laws were basically supported when the Supreme Court in 1896 in Plessy versus Ferguson established the doctrine separate but equal. Within seven years of that dedication, in 1914, Congress passed the Smith-Lever Act. The act is a federal law that establishes a system of cooperative extension services connected to land-grant universities to inform people about current developments in agriculture, home economics, public policy and government, leadership, 4-H, economic development, coastal issues, and several other related subjects. A key component was allowing farmers to learn new agricultural techniques through home instruction. Each eligible state received 30,000 acres of federal land, either within or adjacent to its boundaries, based on each member of Congress the state had as of the 1860 census. The land or proceeds from its sale was to be used towards establishing and funding the educational institutions. The African-American farmers were being denied the resource allocations made available to European-American farmers, which rendered their businesses and living conditions less competitive and efficient to European-American farmers. They needed the same information on the latest farm and home processes and techniques made available to European-American farmers. Let's point out a couple of um, facts before we move on. The Smith-Lever Act worked in tandem with the Morrill Act of 1862 and 1890, the Agricultural and Mechanical College Land Act. What this did is created the Land Act universities. And how this was done was that federal land was used to either fund or provide a location for these schools. A lot of our main universities were created this way through the Morrill Act. Now, the second point that we should consider is the act, the Smith-Lever Act, did not appear to really want to fully fund African-American farmers. What they used as their base for population was the 1860 census. The 1860 census only included free African-Americans. Enslaved African-Americans were on a separate schedule. It was the 1870 census for the first time that included all African-Americans by their surname. Now, Gabe Bryant and his associates, Gabe being the first president of the newly created Negro Farm Bureau and home organization. His first goal was to get a farm agent for the African-American farmers that, and make sure their needs were met that were ignored by the Chatham County Farm Bureau. Now, one thing that was enlightening for Gabe Bryant and his associates is they quickly realized that in order for them to be competitive with their counterparts, they were to receive the same resources that their counterparts received. For example, in education, in business and economic development, in home and health care improvements. Now, Gabe Bryan and his associates did find that farm agent. His name was Neil Alexander Bailey. He came from North Carolina Agricultural Cooperative Agency. Now, Neil, what he was able to do that was introduced by Gabe Bryant and his organization was able to spread all information statewide to the African-American farmers on the latest research universities information 
that help improve their farming methods and their associated needs. Another obstacle they had to overcome was finding a location for the African American Farm Bureau agent. During that time, the Jim Crow laws required that the European American Farm Bureau agent would have a separate facility for their offices. And as a result, Gade and the board members went from church to church in order to secure the donations to be able to purchase the bricks, hire the mason, and hire the carpenter in order to establish an office and a facility to house the African American Farm Bureau agent. And another obstacle arose because they were aiming to create a status quo situation for the African American Farm Bureau Association. And they offered, and this was the European American agent along with the Chatham County Superintendent of Schools, offered to donate the land in exchange for the facility that would house the African American Farm Bureau agent. And Gabe knew that this would be a subordinate situation which would be similar to sharecropping and would allow for the European uh, Farm Bureau agent to be the supervisor over the African American Farm Bureau agent. So he turned down their offer and instead donated his property near to the Pittsburgh courthouse and donated that land in order to purchase or have established their own facility uh, for their, the African American Farm Bureau agent. Another obstacle arose where the government officials at that time on a technicality stated to the Negro Farm Bureau Association members that they had four less months to be able to erect their facility or the offer and the opportunity would be over. And so the membership and GAIDE had to focus They bore down and they were able to continue and finish the building construction for the Negro Farm Bureau agent within the time that was stipulated. We're still benefiting this day. Gabe Bryant was a true pioneer and hero. His approach to change was that of what is identified as social entrepreneurship. He made it possible not only for an education for their community's farming businesses, but work together with the entities to establish family entertainment via a community fair and advocating to establish the first African police officers in Pittsburgh. Gabe Bryant was a God-fearing man, a loving family man, a self-made businessman, while simultaneously fulfilling the role as a community leader who advocated for a group of farmers and impacted a whole community. Ann Bryant and her son Gabe Bryant And all of his siblings' DNA is in all of us. Carry on the legacy. 